Now I have a story um, about that. This is uh, this was about ten years ago, and it, um, usually as I'm a vascular surgeon, it happened this week. I was doing a surgery. I was able to help somebody save a leg, and a nurse said, "Oh, you must just be happy that you know you help people all the time and things are good." And it's in medicine, there's not always a baby born at the end of things here. There's, there's things that happen that um, say more about life than just a simple happy ending. This uh, patient of mine came to me. He was um, close to 80 years old, and he had a very large aneurysm, and his wife had been my patient for four or five years. And the, he had an aneurysm, which is the blood vessel in his, in his belly was extremely large. Normally, it'd be like the size of a quarter, a cylinder the size of a quarter. This was the size of a grapefruit. And he, was, he had started to develop severe back pain regarding this. And he was found to not be able to have things done except with old-fashioned open surgery based on his anatomy. I don't want to get bogged down in the details. He ultimately needed surgery. Because of my relationship with the family, though I offered for him to go to Boston, he wanted it to be done locally, and he was known to be very high risk, having had his first heart attack 25 years ago. I had offered to him to watch it and see how it goes. He said, I can't live with it, I, what's happening, what's going on. We set up the surgery, and a few days before the surgery, he came back to the office alone. And he came back, and he asked me to check a rash on his leg. I was like, oh, no, that's nothing. Don't worry about it. And then he stops in the, in the, way to, in the room with me. It's called the doorknob comment. We always worry when somebody says, oh, one more thing, doctor. I get this pain in my chest. That's nothing, right? So he stops, and he says, he takes out a, a small Catholic prayer book. And um, he said, you know, I'm looking at you, and you're a young doctor. And... Um, I just want you to understand that I'm at complete peace with God, with my family. If anything happens to me, I just wouldn't want it to be on you for your life. And I said, well, okay, now, do you want to not do this? Are you feeling this thing? He said, no, I have to do it. I, can't, I, I know that, you know, this is it, but I, I had to come back without my wife here and been married for 50 years. And that doesn't happen every day. I said, okay, that's great. We did the surgery. We did the surgery, and it went perfect. Minimal blood loss. He got off the respirator right away. He was sitting up. We sent him to ICU. Most of them go to the floor now, the regular med surge floor. We left him there because of how bad his heart was. His wife was there for the whole surgery. I round early the morning, post-op day one. The day after surgery, she's there first thing early in the morning with him. He's perfectly fine. Post-operative day two, he's perfectly fine. Post-operative day three, he's got a tray of food. We start having a discussion. We should send him to the floor because he can't stay in the ICU forever. We're just worried and nervous about him. So we say, okay, the fourth day, we'll send him to the floor. His heart's doing good. His kidneys are fine. He's perfectly with it. He's smiling. Post-op day four, I round early in the morning and his wife, probably a little tired, thinks doesn't come in. Doesn't, doesn't come in that morning. Um, I think she's finally not worried. She's a very worrying type person. I go in there. I'm talking to him. I just meet him. He's as normal as I'm talking to you. I step out into the doctor area, and he has a cardiac arrest right there. Just as I'm right leaving the room. Put him on a respirator. Give him air. We do CPR on him and put him on a respirator, give him all sorts of medicines. He's down for 25 minutes for an old guy, completely dead. We were ready to say, that's it, he's gone. And boop, boop, the monitor comes back, he comes back. They bring up an echo, they say his heart is barely squeezing. I look at him, I shake him, I talk to him, I do his pupils, he's already gone. Okay, just totally out. I, of course, at the same time, you know what happens. Guess who shows up? His wife is here. Okay, 
This is when you're a doctor. So I go, I talk to her that he had a cardiac arrest, and she knew he was high risk. She, she is extremely distraught about what? That she came in late that day, that she didn't get to say goodbye. You know, now I'm saying, you know, he loves you and all that. That's second hand, right? I wanted to be with him. I said, well, unfortunately, he's completely unresponsive. He's been, he was 25 minutes down, and there's nobody there. She walks in the room. She says his name. He immediately opens his eyes. He mouths, I love you, to her right away. He squeezes her hand. She tells him, I love you. First hand, love. He's gone in five minutes. That's it. That's firsthand love. That's the love that you need to know, that our children need to know, that people who walk in here need to know. Face to face, mano a mano, man to man. That's love. Not, I heard it through the grapevine. That's Jesus' love. Now, that's the knowledge we're talking about. You don't get that in a book. His wife has, for 10 years, seen me once a year for her own checkup. And that humbles me. And we've talked many times about her husband and how I believe God literally sent him back. Said, you got five minutes. Say what you need to. Um, so that's the knowledge and then it speaks about, I just, you know, I just say that in the body and as we are here and we're small or whatever, Thomas Kempis, an old Catholic mystic, said something simple. He who loves much does much. 